so my name is David. I, um, <coughs> I study computer science at the Technical University of Munich. There I collaborated with the uh, IT uh, security chair, uh, did some work on, um, on topics that are you know, uh, IT security and machine learning related. Then I worked for, uh, did a project at Fraunhofer um, ISEC at their cognitive security department in Munich. There, um, so this group focuses on the intersection between machine learning and um, computer security. And specifically, what I worked on there were, um, was the susceptibility of neural networks to so-called adversarial examples. So I was trying to come up, uh, that is to implement techniques that um, detected adversarial examples before they reached the target network. Just a quick question, how many people here have heard of the term adversarial examples before? Just raise your hands. OK. Um, how many of you have generated your, uh, your own adversarial examples with some code locally? OK. Um, have any of you published something, some some, something at a scientific venue? OK, great. Otherwise, I would invite you to give the talk. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, the way uh, we'll structure this. So at the beginning, uh, we will talk about like, the type, different types of attacks and some countermeasures that uh, people have developed. And then one type of attack that we'll talk about deals with these adversarial examples. Um, and then we will talk about kind of what they are, how we generate them, and then we'll look at some interesting attacks that people have done with them so that you can see them in action. Um, yeah. So this should be familiar to all of you. It's kind of uh, what we do to get a, a, a model from, yeah, what, what we do, the phases that we uh, go through to get a model into production. So we uh, collect some data, we train the model, we, um, we test the model, we, by eval you know, we evaluate its performance, and if it's good enough, then we deploy it and use it to make predictions. Um, we uh, differentiate between these two phases, the training phase, where we try to find some good parameters for the model so that it performs well, and the testing phase where we give it inputs and it gives us outputs. Um, and the reason why I show this is because we can very nicely like, show um, what, what phases these different attacks uh, target. So let's start with poisoning attacks. Um, so here the adversary will try to mess with the, um, with the training set of the target model. Let's say that the, uh, the uh, attacker is targeting a, a binary classifier that does some kind of spam detection. So you have a spam, detection, a spam detector, and given an input, it tells you, is it spam or is it not spam? And <coughs> what, the, what an adversary could do as a poisoning attack would be to um, either to insert new examples into, into the training set, or to modify examples in the training set, or to like, flip the labels of examples in the training set. So he's trying to influence the, um, the behavior of the final model by um, modifying the data that it's being trained on. And those, uh, those kind of attacks we would categorize in here. Um, then we also differentiate between um, evasion and impersonation attacks. So evasion attacks would be, so, so here the model is already trained. So we can't influence the training set anymore. But what we can do is influence the, uh, the input that we give to the model. So what we would do is, so for example, if um, we take the, the spam detector, we could um, take our spam and modify certain words in it, such that the detector um, is less likely to classify our example as spam. So we're trying to evade the spam, detec the spam detector by uh, modifying our input. And the, um, the impersonation attacks would be, let's say we have some, uh, again, image classifier that, does, um, that tries to classify like, faces of people into, into, the, into different categories. And the categories represent the, the identity of the people. Um, we would also try to, yeah, we would also try to modify the input such that one input gets classified as another. So we would try to impersonate another input by modifying the one that we have, and then you know one face would be, um, yeah, classified as another face. And we also have inversion attacks. Those deal with like privacy issues. So <coughs> one example would so all attacks where the attacker figures tries to figure out something he's not supposed to know, we. Uh, put into, into this category, inversion attacks. For example, let's say that the company um, spends a lot of money to uh, create some training set, then trains the model, works really well, and then some adversary um, tries, to, tries to steal the parameters without having the training set. So the, the, this attack people call model theft. So he would essentially get the parameters of this model and enjoy all the benefits of having the model without having to pay the price for the training set. 
Yeah, so, so those categories we would put here in, 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 version, uh, in inversion attacks, also attacks where the attacker tries to find out something about the training set that he's not supposed to know. Maybe the training set has some uh, sensitive information like medical data and so on. And by being careful about how he looks at the behavior of the model, maybe he can make some inferences about like, wh what, kind of, what uh, the training set looks like, like the male to female ratio of stuff like that. So figuring out stuff that he's not supposed to know in version attacks. Right, so um, the same way we categorized attacks, we, would, we could also categorize um, defensive techniques. So data sanitization would be everything where we, we look at the training set before we train, and we make sure that nothing suspicious is going on. Those would be data sanitization. Um, algorithm robustness, so the algorithms that um, you know, people use were designed without having an adversary in mind. So maybe by designing uh, new algorithms with an adversary in mind, maybe we can make them inherently more robust. So th this kind of work would go in here. Um, security assessment, so let's say you have a spam detector and you want to evaluate its performance. You would usually use like, I don't know, some, some performance metrics, uh, like accuracy, um, precision, recall, these kind of things. And here, uh, people say, OK, maybe you could also use um, some robustness metric. So not only uh, would you uh, evaluate the predictive performance of your model, but you would also evaluate its robustness. Yeah, so just add new metrics while evaluating. Um, and privacy preserving techniques. Uh, so if you're interested in a success story here, um, just search for uh, differential privacy in the context of adversarial examples. It's a really good example for this type of defense. But it takes long to explain, so just, let's just give it. Um, so this, uh, this is a figure from kind of the paper that coined the term adversarial examples. And basically, the way that they explain it is the way that I will explain it. So what are adversarial examples? Um, is there a, some of you raised your hands if you have seen them before? Does someone want to try um, like to explain what they are in your words? Just a simple explanation. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Sure. Uh, Go for it. Are examples that are designed to trick our algorithm? Yes, exactly. So um, we start with some kind of natural example something that has been drawn from the same distribution as the, as the training data. So it's similar to the training data. The model is supposed to perform well on that. And we add some noise. Now, this is not random noise. This is like a, a carefully crafted noise that we add onto it. So we modify the pixels of our original image. And then the, the model goes crazy and gives us uh, answers that don't make sense. So in this case, the authors um, showed an image of a panda. Everybody, like we humans, look at this. It's obviously a panda. The model is only 57% confident that it's a panda. We add this random noise. To us, this still looks like a panda. But the model set is, is much more certain, is almost completely certain that this is a gibbon, like a type of an ape, which, which doesn't make sense. Yes? Is this noise specifically designed for a panda detector? Or can you <coughs> it's. Will it pull other, similar, like other animal pictures? Uh, um, so this will work for this target network for this panda. So if you have another example and you want to fool the network for that, then you would need to uh, craft noise specific to that other image. But this noise crafting is not like super expensive. We will, we will get to that. So you, you can do this noise, craft, noise crafting for every image that you want the uh, target model to make a mistake on. OK. OK, so here we deal with images. Uh, so why, why is this relevant to you? Maybe you don't work with images. Maybe you, I don't know, you use sounds or text or something else. Um, so most work in this uh, field, in this adversarial example research, has been done in uh, computer vision, so with like images and video. But there's also work um, that attacks uh, speech recognition systems. Um, uh, there's also work that uh, attacks seg segmentation models. There's also uh, work that attacks uh, like neural machine translation. There's also something for, um, uh, for reinforcement learning and so on. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, everywhere where we use machine learning, these models are susceptible to these kind of attacks. So it's, it's not just images, although people talk about images because you, know, you can nicely visualize them. And, and yeah, it's a good starting point. So we talked about what adversarial examples are. And then you asked the question about like, how, how do we generate them. So let's go uh, more into that. So this is kind of conceptually how we do it. Uh, you would take, so imagine that the, this, um, so, so here we have multiple classes. Imagine that this is an image classifier that takes an image as an input and then classifies it. So we take an image, we transform it to a feature vector, and then in the feature vector space, it will be one point. For example, this one. Let's say that this is an, an, a normal image. 
let's say this is our panda. And then what we do is we look for two things. So we want, um, on one side, we want to cross a decision boundary because, so this is the plot of like decision boundaries of the model. And so the first thing is we want to cross a decision boundary because by definition, if we cross the decision boundary, the decision of the model is going to change. And we want the decision to change because we wanted to make a mistake. And the second thing we optimize for is we, we want to make as few changes to the original base sample as possible because we want to generate adversarial examples that both trick the model, so cross the decision boundary, but also that looks similar to the, to the one where we started, to the natural example. So, so, so we optimize for those two things. And then we get this really nice effect of having an adversarial example that looks like the original one, but that, um, that gets classified as something else. Yeah, so, so this uh, is just to illustrate. Um, and later we, we will, uh, I will briefly talk about where we can learn more about like, specific algorithms to do this. This is just kind of conceptually how it works. And then, and then there are like different algorithms that, optimi <coughs> that optimize different cost functions to like actually make it work. Okay, so. Okay, we're good. Um, so uh, uh, in, the, in recent years, like a lot of papers have been published on this topic, a lot of defenses. And usually what ends up happening is people publish a defense and then it gets broken very quickly. So for example, here um, we have uh, 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 NeurIPS 2018, this was last year, and a paper that was kind of in the top 3% of submissions. So it was a good conference, good papers, talented authors, and still two months later, um, this defense that everybody was, talk everybody was talk to talking about was broken. And this happens over and over again. It's not like I cherry picked an example. So in this, uh, actually in this conference also like several other defenses have been published, and the same thing happened. Right? And, uh, so as of today, the only defense that kind of works um, is some form of adversarial training, where, which is, um, so usually uh, you have some model, you have your natural example, your training set, and the model performs well in the training set because you train on it. And then, okay, so we have these other examples that are supposed to be similar, but for some reason the model makes mistakes for these examples, the adversarial examples. So the idea behind adversarial training is, well, let's put the, advers the adversarial examples into the training set and train on them, and then the model should perform well on them too. And this may sound super simple, but it's, like, it's the best thing that we've got. So this is the best defense that exists as of today. And it only kind of works because um, if you have different, gener so if you, if you train it on one kind of adversarial examples, it will be good at defending against those, but then maybe the attacker uses different kind of perturbations, uses a different algorithm, and then we again have to train for those. But you can't, in advance, train for all kinds of algorithms. So yeah, so, so that's kind of an issue there. And so I, what I want to say, it's still an open problem to like, find uh, defenses for this. So let's talk about some attacks. Let me just see how I do with the time. Oh my god. <laughs> we will be a few minutes late for the, for the final event. So, so let's go through really, really quickly for, through, a, uh, through a few specific attacks that use adversarial examples to like, do it, perform attacks. So in this paper, they uh, took uh, models that are being offered as a service. They, choose a Goog they chose Google and Amazon. So they, use, uh, they offer some deep neural networks for some tasks. They tell you, OK, these models are supposed to perform, perform some task well. And all you can do as a user is you send queries in there, you get, you get the output. So you send an example in, you get the label, like an output. And what they did is, is really cool. So they, um, they they were able to trick these models behind the interface, so behind the API, by not knowing the architecture, not knowing the training set, not knowing, um, not knowing the model parameters, nothing. They only made queries through the API, <coughs> which is not suspicious at all. It's normal user behavior. They just send queries through the API. And they managed to, with 800 queries, they managed to, um, to learn enough about the, the, uh, the behavior of this model to train a similar model locally so they have a similar substitute model locally. Then, because it's locally, they can um, do a bunch of queries on that. Um, so, f so they generate these adversarial examples for the local model. And then it turns out that these, uh, these adversarial examples transfer to the one behind the API. Right, so, so they kind of send a bunch of queries, learn how it behaves, then train a similar model, generate adversarial examples for that, and then it works for the model behind the API. And it works, it works surprisingly well. Yeah, so, um, 
So the realistic, realistic attacks are possible in digital environments, and the lesson is to be careful if users can precisely control uh, the digital representation of your inputs. Why do I say digital representation? Because, well, for example, in the next attack, they tried. Um, so in the first attack, they could actually send images <coughs> to, to the model. But what if they can't directly send like the pixel values of their image to the model? Maybe the model uh, perceives images through a camera. And the best you can do is put an image in front of this camera. And then you can't precisely control the pixel values because the camera is imperfect. You printing out this image is imperfect. And then a lot of things get lost. And these things still work. So they, they managed to like print out an adversarial example on paper. And this still fooled a state-of-the-art uh, image detector, image uh, classifier. Uh, they also managed to 3D print objects, for example, a turtle that was misclassified as a rifle in all of these frames that are red. So these are different frames, all of them that are red. So the model thinks this is a rifle, this is a rifle, 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 and here it's a turtle, and that's it. So, so, so they work uh, surprisingly well. And then what people did, so this was kind of, okay, this is possible. And then maybe some of you have already seen this. Uh, so people generate these adversarial examples in the form of glasses. Um, so they, they put a bunch of constraints on the thing that they optimize for. And then they can say, okay, please only change specific pixel in this region, the specific pixels in this region. And then we interpret this as glasses. And then they print out, th they can print this out and like glue to actual glasses. And then they, they uh, put themselves with these glasses in front of a like a face recognition system. And they took commercial face recognition systems to check this with. If somebody has heard of uh, Face++, plus plus, uh, they took this. And um, yeah, it works really well in a lab environment. But so far, it doesn't work in, uh, under realistic conditions. So because the, you know, the camera can move around, so there are like different viewpoints, and the lightning changes, lighting changes, and then the adversarial examples don't work in those cases. Um, and then similarly, so OK, we can print it out. So th th these don't have to be glasses. These can be, uh, like, this can be a hat. This can be a necklace and earrings. doesn't really matter as long as like, the surface is large enough. And the same thing here. They print something out. They stick it onto, not glasses, but road signs. And they want the, uh, the um, image classifier to misclassify these road signs. So the goal is, for example, here, what they try to do is they try to um, make the model misclassify stop sign for a speed limit. So while, let's say, an autonomous vehicle uh, um, approaches a, a, um, a uh, how do you say, <coughs> some crossroad, and it's, there should be a stop sign, but it misclassified as a, you know, you can drive 100 kilometers per hour sign, you, you, could, you, know, you could imagine that the consequences wouldn't be that nice. So they did this, and it worked surprisingly well under real conditions. But, just, but the, the way they do these experiments is they take the model, and they directly, so, so they take the model, they walk around with the camera, and it picks up these frames, and it misclassifies a bunch of these frames, and this works really well. But still, um, you know, it, it, nobody does end-to-end -end tests on like a real system, because you, you can, you can, th um, if you think about like a real autonomous vehicle, it probably wouldn't base the entire decision of whether to speed up or slow down just on what the model says, right? So there were pro there would probably be some other sensors in the vehicle that would tell it, okay, a crossroad is we're approaching a crossroad. The model says we should uh, speed up to 100 kilometers per hour, but we know that we shouldn't, so we will just ignore what the model says. Right, so even if you manage to trick the model, this doesn't immediately mean that you would actually cause some damage. Right, so, and so far, nobody has done actual damage with these things, and it's, you know, it's, we will see if this will ever happen. And you, you could do this on like a car or a drone. So yeah, th these things kind of work, but still uh, there are no evaluations on end-to-end -end systems. And then you could do the similar things with sound. So if you think about like virtual assistants and so on, it doesn't have to be images. You can put these, this noise over sound. And uh, actually, only uh, recently, like in June, uh, a paper has come out uh, about these things. And they, so they, they were attacking uh, <coughs> speech recognition systems. And they found that it was really difficult to make these um, adversarial examples work reliably over the air. So if you would have some speaker, and it would utter these um, these noises with these uh, perturbations in them, um, the perturbations would kind of get lost on the way to the microphone, and the adversarial example wouldn't work. So, so as of today, there is no practical like, concern uh, for these things. So quick summary, um, only attacks on machine learning as a service are kind of realistic. So if the user has uh, a good control over the digital, digital representation of inputs, then it kind of gets problematic. But the rest is not uh, 
at least right now, not that, uh, not that much of a concern. And so this might change because a lot of adversarial example papers uh, are being published. If, if you look at like the top machine learning conferences, you'll always see like a bunch of uh, defenses being proposed and a bunch of evaluations, and the number of them kind of rises. So maybe something will happen in the future, who knows? But like as of today, um, only, only these machine learning as a service attacks are somewhat realistic. And then I said, uh, if you're interested in like specific algorithms to generate these adversarial examples, um, you can check out this, this blog post I wrote. Um, there it will walk you through, through some code. Um, so it will uh, teach you how to train your own small neural network, how to generate some adversarial examples for it, how to visualize them side by side next to the original examples. Um, and it will show you like the influence that uh, the adversarial examples have on the confidence of the model and stuff like that. So if you're interested in more details, you can go see that. And now we, I, I'm probably way over the time limit. No, no, no. no? You're good. You have two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Okay, that's good. Why did why did why did I speed up so much? <laughs> okay. Um, so if you have some questions, we can uh, talk about that. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's a very good point. So what you're saying, you're trying to uh, make a proposal for a future defense yes. where they would like put such a filter like the air like in front of the model. Service. Yes, yes. Um, yes, like a, a lot of uh, such defenses kind of propose such filters. And usually how people break them is they um, train. So the, so this, uh, the uh, adversarial example generation techniques, kind of optimization techniques. So they would optimize for this specific filter. And then this technique would work really well in this filter. And then it would break it. And now a good question would be, OK, why can't we just optimize for air? And maybe it will work on air. And this is exactly what they did in, in not this paper, but in this one below. And it just didn't work. So if somebody can build a filter that works like air, maybe it's, good, it's a good offense. Uh, yes? Has anyone tried to add random noise? Because the, the noise yes. levels you're, you're referring to like one, less than 1%, so it's a low uh, noise signal ratio. So adding random noise Ah, so you, you want to, so it's another kind of proposal for a defense. You override the perturbations by putting some random noise over them. Yeah. Yes, yes, and uh, a lot of, so there are a lot of defenses that do that. And usually they, um, so the way you generate noise, you need to write some algorithm for that. So there are some rules for how you generate this noise. Or, yeah, and usually how they break is that they, random. totally random noise. So usually how they break it is they just train against this, uh, this random generation. And then they fig they figure out some perturbations that you can't um, that you can't override, yeah. Or or they make the perturbations so strong that they're stronger than your noise, and yeah. But but then if you if you add too much noise, maybe you will then influence the performance of the model that's behind of it. So yeah, it all depends on yeah how it is. Yeah. Yes. Um, you have shown how you create this adversarial noise um, with these with this, um, uh, borders, uh, glass borders, exactly. But in your picture, this is just two-dimensional. That's, of course, very simple. But in reality, you have, you have thousands of dimensions. Should you turtle red, yes. Um, how do you do this? You are, is this an iterative optimization process? Or how do you find the closest border or the minimal change of your input? Yes, so, um, so in practice, we don't we even try to visualize the dimensions. Right. So this is just like conceptually how it works. But in practice, you just take an optimization algorithm and just let it work. Okay. And it doesn't matter how okay. many so dimensions. So it's an iterative process like, like um, 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 back propagation. Or yeah, so, so, so most attacks just use gradient descent. Yeah, gradient descent, right. To, to like, uh, yeah, create okay. These, okay. these things. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so that's it. With so if you have some questions afterwards, you can always ask me. Cool.